My name is Julie Hart and I'm the Senior Director for Standards and Excellence at the American Alliance Museums. And today we're going to talk about one of the core documents, Institutional Codes of Ethics. So an Institutional Code of Ethics, I must admit, is one of the most challenging, difficult documents of the five core documents for most museums to write. In my experience working with museums through the accreditation and museum assessment programs over the years. But what an institutional code of ethics is, is a statement of your values, your institutional values. If your mission statement is what, why you exist and, and um, what you do, your institutional code of ethics really goes to the next stage and talks about the values of your organization. It puts forth your public trust responsibilities and your stewardship responsibilities as a museum. It goes much far beyond uh, just individual behaviors related to conflict of interest. Most institutions, when you say code of ethics, immediately go to the uh, type of disclosure and conflict of interest statements that might be in a personnel policy. But this is much different. A code of ethics for your institution governs the, in, governs the individual behaviors of the staff and the volunteers and the board members. But again, it's talking about their behavior in the larger sense of what it means to be a museum and what it means to work in a museum. So a code of ethics is a very, very important document. And again, it's one of the most difficult to write, but it is probably uh, ex just extremely important because it's your contract with your public and those, your stakeholders about your public trust responsibilities. It's putting those into writing. It's really demonstrating your accountability and your transparency and both those factors, both inside your organization to each other, but also to your public. And it's a very important document that takes you above and beyond the law. Ethics are, uh, the, well, the law and legal uh, things are the minimum. Your code of ethics takes you above the minimum. These are not things that you have to do. These are things you should do as a good, responsible organization. And again, like your mission statement, it's very critical for decision making. It helps to give you the parameters and the guidelines for making difficult decisions and often very, very difficult decisions, particularly ones uh, that can be very tempting when it comes to uh, dollars involved. There's often a lot of struggle between money and mission, and a code of ethics can often step in and help you stay on the right path and think of the bigger picture. So I want to talk about a few of the required elements for the Code of Ethics. And every core document has a set of required elements. And for the Code of Ethics, it does need to apply to staff, board, and volunteers. It's one comprehensive, cohesive document, not a different Code of Ethics for the board or a different Code of Ethics for the staff and a different Code of Ethics for the volunteers. It's for the whole of the institution. And it really needs to be consistent with uh, the AAM Code of Ethics for Museums, um, sort of in alignment with the spirit of it, as well as any individual codes that apply to your museum's discipline. For example, um, if you're an art museum or a history organization, many of the other disciplines, like the Association for State and Local History, have a code of ethics that's more tailored to that particular stakeholder group. So we look to institutions to uh, look at those other examples and models. And again, you want to be in alignment with the spirit and the values and the standards and best practices that they're promoting. And the key thing about a code of ethics is, it, like your mission statement, it needs to be extremely tailored to your organization. That means you're taking into account all the unique factors about what you collect, what kind of geographic community you're in, what kind of issues that you may deal with, one of the worst things you can do is cut and paste. There are plenty of samples that you can get, but it's very important that you take the time and have a very thoughtful process at the organizational level about what your values are and what are some of the ethical issues that you might come up against. For example, do you ha deal with um, uh, culturally specific objects, culturally sensitive objects, human remains? Do you deal with living artists? Do you deal with uh, things that are alive, animals, plants? All of those have very different kind of ethical responsibilities and obligations associated with them as well. So it's very important that you can't just um, sort of put your name on a generic ethics code. And almost the process of going through it, having the discussions, in some ways, is just as valuable as the end result. 
So your et code of ethics is also, as I mentioned, needing to talk about the broad responsibilities of the organization as a museum, not just about the individual actions. It's really good to have those further detailed in personnel policies or maybe your board governance manual. Um, and your code of ethics can refer to other documents and other policies where you might have conflict of interest and other ethical issues. And one of the places that's really key to has, that has a connection with the code of ethics is your collections management policy when it comes to using the use of proceeds from the sale of deaccessioned objects. And this is one of the most critical things in the museum field and in these documents. Your code of ethics and your collections management policy need to articulate clearly that you will only use proceeds from the sale of deaccessioned objects for the acquisition of new collections or the direct care of collections. And it's very important that the museum take this opportunity as well to think out the scope and the parameters of what direct care means to them. It's a very broad term and it can mean different things to different types of organizations. I do encourage you to learn more about the topic of direct care to go to the AM website and learn uh, to download our copy of our latest white paper series of recommendations and guidelines on direct care that we've spent more than the last two years working on. And it has a number of tools and guiding questions and some very discipline specific guidance to help you think about what direct care is for your organization. I also did mention that it needs to be a single cohesive document that is approved by the governing authority. 